Hi there, and welcome to a really fun interview episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am just so excited to be here with Sherry Swalwell, who is actually a virtual friend. This is the first time we're meeting in person, but um, she's worked with Alana, and we've worked together on some things, and I'm just really happy to be able to sit down and have this conversation with Sherry today. Sherry is a, and she told me to do this, to say she is a wife and a mom first and an author second, but um, being an author is a very important and um, just influential way that God has used her in just so many ways to reach women and um, just to glorify God through her gift of writing. And that's what we're going to be sharing with you today and, and what I'm excited to talk a little bit more about. So Sherry, thank you for joining us here on the podcast, finally. Oh, I'm so excited. It is nice to be able to see you instead of just virtually having that relationship. So this is really fun today. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, well, we like to start our interview episodes with a just for fun question. And lately, I've been sticking with the same one because it's been really fun to hear all the different answers. So um, the question today is, what is your favorite prayer closet, the place that you feel closest to God? <laughs> I had to laugh with that because it started out as just a um, Ottoman. And then it moved into a rocking chair in our bedroom, and now it's back out to the big comfy chair in the living room. So really, wherever it's quiet. <laughs> yes. And as a mom, now, how many kids do you have? We have three. Three children. So as a yeah. mom of three, it's not always easy to find a quiet place. No, no, it isn't. It's fun, <laughs> but yeah, not very easy. <laughs> not very easy, no. And oh. Alana and I like to talk about Susanna Wesley and how she would put her apron up over her head. She had, I don't know how many kids, but it's yeah. just kind of, you know, that would, that would, even if it wasn't quiet, it was at least dark. <laughs> <laughs> I have thought about that. I'm like, that is a very wise woman. <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, today we are at, you know, a just for fun question is maybe not appropriate for a we're going to be talking about a very heavy topic and just some challenges and some real heartache that you have gone through. And, and we're going to be talking a little bit later about Sherry's book, Hope During Heartache, which um, I just am really happy to get out there because I think I know that all of us experience heartache at some time. And you're going to be talking about a very specific type of heartache, though. Um, and so could you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you and your husband faced in 2006 and 2007? Absolutely. And actually, it's really funny because I have to, um, that was a very happy time in our life. Um, so you know how a lot of pastors talk about, and our pastor just this past Sunday said, you're either going through a trial, have just been through a trial, or you're getting ready to go through a trial. And we were in that just getting ready to go through a trial phase, and we didn't know it at the time. So yeah. we had been married um, seven years at, the, well, six, no, seven years at that point. Um, we had a four-year-old three-year-old and a six-year-old. I worked from home. I did a daycare, um, and it was honestly like one of the best seasons in my life. I loved it. Our kids were the great age. Um, my husband and I, we had that time. It was before, you know, everybody has all these activities and you're going in all the different directions. Um, and it was just a wonderful, wonderful season. And we had gotten married a little bit older. And so we had decided that two was our number. Um, and we were totally happy with two. I, being a daycare provider, could have had 12. But, you know, <laughs> money, age, all that good stuff. I was happy borrowing other people's children during the day and then giving them back at night. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up finding out that God had different plans and we were pregnant. And I was ecstatic. Like, I was like, God, thank you so much. This is awesome. I'm getting another one. We get to do this again. I had this child who was not even like six weeks in the womb five years old already. Like, right. I mean, I just, I was dreaming. It was wonderful. And um, so I woke up one morning and I was having complications. I was bleeding. And within, well, by two o'clock that afternoon, we had lost the baby. And um, it, it was, it was hard because we had just started telling people that week, it was the 12 week mark. 
and we had just started telling people they were excited for us. We had told our family at Thanksgiving and um, it was, it was hard. It was just really, really hard. Um, I didn't realize how hard it would be because you haven't met the child yet. But like I said, in my eyes, he was five, he or she was already five. Like I loved this baby, you know, beyond, beyond. So that was, um, that was in December, middle of December when we lost the baby. And then in February, um, as I was still trying to just wrap my head around, um, the loss and, and actually when you have a miscarriage, you have two losses because you lose the baby. So you have the date of that death but then you have the impending date of the delivery. And mm -hmm. honestly, I think that that's as hard or harder because you have that looming over your head and you have the empty um, womb, but you also have the empty arms. Like it's just to me that it's just a double whammy. Like it just keeps getting thrown in your face. And then to make matters worse, you have society that even though you know, you may have just looked up a pregnancy question on the computer. Now you've got all these people calling you. Do you want to sign up for this? And you get, you know, baby Stop formula the samples mail. in the mail and wow. diaper samples. And so you're just getting hit. You, you just get hit hard from a lot of a lot of different areas. So miscarriage is hard because you can't really get away from it. It's and then you have that whole one year anniversary and you get two anniversaries to to do it with. So well, and I'm um, sure reminders of other people around you having babies or if you knew someone that was pregnant at the same time, those kinds of things too. Oh, absolutely. Mm. And and honestly, Jamie, I think it's just as hard for infertility. Like right. it took us, well, with our second child, it took us nine months to get pregnant with her. And all these people were getting pregnant all around me and I'm going, what is wrong? What is taking so long? Why are we not getting pregnant? And that was with our daughter who we had quote unquote planned. Um, and then, then we didn't plan our third. Um, but God did like, I say we didn't, but we don't plan anything really. If you think right. about it, <laughs> yeah, we have control. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, God has the best plan, but, um, but yeah, so the whole infertility miscarriage, it's, it's just a really hard journey. It really is. It's a hard challenge. So we dealt with that in December. And then in February, um, my husband got really sick. He went from fine, which we know now underneath, he really wasn't fine, but he went from what we thought was fine to in the hospital and he lost 30 pounds within a month's time. And we didn't know, we didn't know if he was going to live. We didn't know, nobody could diagnose him. Nobody could find out what was wrong with him. Um, so from February to May, he was undiagnosed, totally miserable and barely hanging on. So I'm trying to deal with losing a baby and now I might be losing my husband. So oh 2006, 2007 was really not our fun years, <laughs> not at all. But I do have to back up just a titch because in September, right before we found out we were pregnant with this baby, I had started a Bible study with a group of women at our church. And I remember distinctly in one of our conversations, we were talking about whether or not we trusted God. And I remember driving home that night and going, God, I don't think I really trust you. I want to. I've been a Christian since I was six, but I don't think I really trust you. So you can teach me to trust you if you want to, but please be gentle about it. Mm -hmm. And then the next month we got pregnant. Two months later, we lost the baby. Two months after that, my husband got sick. And we have been on a journey, or I have been on a journey of learning how to trust him ever since. So it, it was the beginning of a quite a big journey for our family. Well, so I love that you brought up the fact that you got in the car and you were just brutally honest with God, because I think um, there might be women listening right now that don't realize that that's okay, you know, or that are afraid to be that honest with God and, and feel like they have to put this mask on, not only with other Christians, but with God himself and try to grin and bear it. But, I, you know, I think that's such an important part of prayer is, number one, acknowledging that 
God knows anyway. I mean, he knows, <laughs> he knows what we're thinking anyway. And so, and he wants that honesty. I really believe not to speak for God, but I really believe that he wants us to come to him, you know, um, kind of like Thomas when he's like, you know, I, I need to see the, the scars in your hands and put my hand in the wound in your side, you know? And I think he wants us to say, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I need your help here. I need you to help me to be able to trust you, or I need you to, you know, help me to have more faith. And I love that about that story. Well, I completely agree. So, so when I was in the spring, so we had, you know, the time tame table was the miscarriage was December. My husband got sick in February. Well, actually, I take that back. I think it was January because it was before he got sick. We were in church and I even remember the song we were singing. It was during worship. And mm -hmm. I remember acknowledging the fact that I was mad at God. Like up until this point, I hadn't let myself be mad because I was like, you can't be mad at God. Nobody's allowed to be mad at God. He, he's going to strike you down with thunderbolts and lightning. And so I'm in church. I stopped singing and I love to sing. Like that's like my favorite part of the whole thing is the worship. So I stopped singing. And I bowed my head and I'm like, God, I am mad at you. And I just stopped and I cringed. Like even my whole body just was like, ah, and nothing happened. And I was like, okay, he, he really does want me to talk to him. I was very respectful. Um, it, it was just like I would talk to my parent, but I was mad and, and I let him know that I was mad. I didn't think it was fair and I don't know why he gave me this gift and then took this gift away. And, mm -hmm. and just like you said, like, it was freeing because he knows anyway, he knew I was mad. And yet once you can get it off your chest and once you can talk to him, then he can start healing. Then he can start the work that needs to be done. But when you ignore it, even within yourself, then you're just kind of stuck. Yeah, I totally agree. And we're going to talk more about your gratitude journal in another podcast interview, but do you, did you write any of that down? I know you're a journaler. Did you write out some of your anger or frustration with God, like Psalms of lament kind of thing, or was it just in prayer? Actually, this period of time was when I was introduced to, or I should say when those who loved me came to me and said, you really should start a blessings journal. And I was like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. No, or actually my real response was the polite, oh, that's a great idea in my head. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to happen. It took probably, well, it was 2013 was when I started. So six years later, it took me, I'm pretty stubborn. It took me six years, but I'll tell you what, if I had any advice to encourage any woman, if somebody comes alongside you and nicely says, hey, maybe you should think about doing something don't wait out of stubbornness. I waited mm -hmm. six years and it has been the blessing journal idea and the whole concept has been probably one of the things that has helped me grow deeper in my faith faster. I wish now that I hadn't wasted that six years. Wow. No, that is good advice. Cause I think all of us have been there where you just kind of even in the moment of you probably didn't realize the extent of your despair or, you know, they, someone was seeing something in you thinking you need help out of this. And we can't see that in ourselves all right. the time. And, you know, the same goes for anything when, you know, someone that you trust comes alongside you and, and suggests something. Yeah. I think we could all benefit from being more open and teachable. That's really good advice. So in general, what would you say during this period, both that was before your husband got sick after your husband got sick, and I mean, that, that time lasted a long time, um, during the, the beginnings of that, what did your prayer life look like? Or was, were there times that you couldn't even pray? How did, how did prayer look in those times? I really clung to the verse, um, and I should have looked it up ahead of time, but I really clung to the verse during that time of the Holy Spirit intercedes for you with groanings when you can't pray. Yeah. There, I was hit so hard and so fast and actually just talking about it just brings it all back, just reminds me of just how intense it was. I mean, I went from being a submissive wife to a husband who did, led our home very well to 
in the midst of my grief and I can't even play with my kids, I now have to take over everything. So um, not that I didn't share the burden with him. Like I paid the bills and I cleaned the house, you know, those things I had done before, but I mean, it was more of that emotional, um, you know, that, that it's now all on me. All he can do is survive at this point. Everything else is on me. And so I think my prayers were just more, help like I I couldn't express what I was feeling like the grief the grief was so just deep like every day I woke up and there was just this longing and this emptiness of just wanting a baby and and it feels like so selfish looking back on it now but but that's just that's where I was at like I felt like everything was being taken away and um, and it was just so palpable. Like I could reach out and touch it. And so the, the, my prayers were just very short and just very, I don't even know, God, I just, I just need help. Like, I just don't even have words. Like, just don't let him die. <laughs> that was basically over and over and over again. Just, just don't let him die. Or yeah, I mean, I'll, I won't, I'll never forget March 30th. Um, I left him in the, at the hospital. We had taken him to the emergency room. I was with him all day long. Um, this was 2007, March 30th, 2007. I'm driving home at like 1130 at night and I'm just sobbing. And at that point, that was probably my breaking point. That was probably when I really started to pray again. And I said, God, I give him to you. Um, if you, if you choose to let him die, if you choose for him to go to heaven now, I know that you will take care of us. But he's yours. So do with him what you want. I give up. Like, I surrendered at that point. And that was really hard. Really, really hard. But it was a, tur it was a turning point. It Like, that that was how I started, or that's when I really started to to trust God. It still took many, many, many years, but that was, that was the turning point for me. That was the surrender. My, I, I call it my Isaac moment. Mm -hmm. So I said, he'll either give him back to me or he won't, but either way, God's God. And I love him. Like, even though I was mad at God, I never once even considered turning away. Like I never once considered not worshiping him, not loving him, not serving him. I was mad. I was sad. I was confused. I wanted to trust him, but I never once considered that this isn't for me. Like I knew that I wouldn't be able to do life or anything that was hitting us without him. Yeah. So at and least that, I had that. Like, Yeah. Well, and that reminds me of when we interviewed Kay Warren about the loss of her son. She said the exact same thing. She said, I, I believed in God. I, but, and, and I knew there was nowhere else to go. Like, where am I going to go? Is there any other place to go to get comfort? You know, it, but I was mad, you know, and I, I, I could totally, <laughs> you know, but I thought, I think her words were, but I thought he was mean. <laughs> For what he did, That's you know, right. I believed yeah. in God, but I thought he was mean. <laughs> and, um, and I love this verse that you brought up. So I, I Googled it while you were talking. <laughs> oh, good, good. It's Romans 8, 26 and 27. And I love this because it's so, I think it's powerful for when we are in the place where we don't have words or where we have those one word prayers that are basically just help. And it's um, right. in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And what a powerful prayer. Not only is the Spirit searching us for what our needs are and taking them to God, but he is interceding in accordance with the will of God, which we don't always even know. And, but the spirit right. knows the will of God. And so that intercession of the spirit is so deeply powerful. And I just wonder if we can take comfort in the fact that during those moments of deepest need, when we just don't have the words, 
that might be some of our pow- most powerful prayer time ever is just releasing and relinquishing ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And, and that might be what brought you to that place of being able to verbalize your surrender. I don't know, but that's, that is such a good, good word from that, that verse. Um, so you said that your, your longing was for a baby and, you know, you shared with me just that you felt guilty about that desire and not wanting to burden your husband who was struggling with his own health issues with wanting to come to him and say, I, now I want a, another baby. I want to try for another baby. So how did you, how did you steward that desire of your heart? What did you do with that? Well, I, I have to give God all the credit for this because honestly, in and of myself, I am not that strong. Like I can be selfish, especially when it comes to children. I, as you introduced me, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, then I'm everything else. That is like, the core of my being. So selfishly, I want it. I mean, let's, let's just be honest here. Woman to woman, there are things that we can do. We can have babies, you know, I mean, we, we don't have to consult with our husbands if we don't want to. Right. That thought never crossed my mind. Like I would never ever in a million years have done that because my husband and I, he seriously is my best friend and we I feel so blessed to have the marriage that I have with him and it's built on mutual trust and it's built on respect. And we like, we don't even fight. Like our fights are very respectful. Like we don't want to jab and we don't want to say things to each other or dig up dirt because we don't want to hurt each other. So going from that, having explained that background, as much as the longing was that I wanted to have another baby, I would never have put that burden on him or manipulated the situation to have that happen. So I knew I, if if that wasn't a choice of mine, then I knew the only choice I did have was to go to God. He gave us the first baby to number three to begin with. So if he wanted us to have another one, then it needed to be his way and it needed to be God honoring. So I don't even remember how or when or where, but some somehow I came across the verse. It had always been one of my favorite verses anyway. And it was Psalm 37, 4. And then, um, well, I'll start with that. And it says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I stopped right there. I'm like, hmm, okay. So if I delight in God, then he'll give me my desires. But having said the mutual respect that I have with my husband, I wanted my heart to match God's heart. Like I really, Mm -hmm. truly did have the desire that if this was his will, then please let Bill and I be on the same page. But if this was not his will, then please just take that overwhelming longing away. I was truly okay with choice A or choice B. I just knew I couldn't live the way I was living now. Like I couldn't live with that, that ache 24 Mm seven. But if God wanted to take it away, I trusted him enough at that point that I could, um, that I knew he'd replace it with something else or he'd give me peace or he'd, he'd somehow fix it. Um, but then I also knew that there was a possibility that he could do the other, but I didn't, I didn't do anything to make the, or to cause the other to happen. So I literally prayed that prayer. I said, God, for, for over a year, I just said, I will delight in you in whatever that means. At that point, I didn't even know what it meant, but I thought, whatever that means, I will delight in you And give me the desires of my heart, but make those desires your desires. Change my desires if that's your will, or let Bill and I come together if that's your will. And, um, well, so we we were pregnant October. We found out in in November of 2006 that we were pregnant with the baby that we lost. And exactly two years later, October of 2008, we got pregnant with our, and we call him our bonus blessing. So um, he's, he's not a mistake. He's not an accident. He is a bonus blessing. And he knows he's, he'll be 10 this year. He knows that he's a gift from God. Like Mm -hmm. he knows. I mean, we tell all of our children that they're gifts from God and that we only have them because God blessed us with them. But if I say, what are you, Derek? He'll be like, I'm your bonus blessing. I'm like, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) 
That is just, that is such a beautiful story. And, you know, I, um, I had a similar experience of wanting another child and my husband and I not being on the same page. And again, like you knowing it's not an option for me to play games or try to manipulate things. And, um, and God, and I, I prayed a very similar prayer, you know, God, take this away, help it to match my desire to match yours. And, um, and in my case, my husband changed his mind and we ended up having our second, but, um, and then our third was a bonus blessing as well. So it was kind of awesome. yeah, one of those things, but you know, this is a very happy story, but it doesn't negate the fact that you lost a child. And, you know, I think for someone that either who, that has never lost a child, um, I think it's hard to understand. And, and so I would like to know what advice you would give someone listening who knows someone who is miscarried but may not personally understand what it's like if they've never gone through it or and miscarried or lost a child at any stage, whether it's in the womb or out, um, how we can pray for them and encourage them. And I mean, it would be a, a great time to talk about your book as well, which really addresses a lot of these things. Well, um, the book came about because that summer, so 2007, before the, ba the baby was supposed to be due 7707. So during that summer, I'm an avid reader. Like I have, I love to read. I love to read stories, stories about people. So I went out searching in order to, to help my grief, to find a book that I could read about how women actually had hope again. Like I just mm -hmm. wanted to know that I would smile again one day because there was no smiling happening. Mm -hmm. And I found this one book and there was 20 stories in it of women. And I thought, Oh great. This is what I want. Cause I don't want to read about the medical statistics and I don't want to read about why it happens and the biology. I don't care about that stuff. I wanted the emotional, the, the real life nitty gritty. And um, so I'm reading this book about these 20 women and I was getting angrier and angrier and angrier because the whole central theme was like anger. Like they were just angry. I'm like, okay, anger is not hope. So I'm not feeling better. This is not helping. So in my anger, because I was in that angry stage, I yelled at God. I was yelling at him, not at him. And I said, God, there is nothing out there that is helping what I want. This is, I cannot find what I need to make me feel better. So maybe I just need to write it. And then I left it at that. And that was 2007. 2014, it was published. So God took that statement of exasperation and he turned it into a dream because I did not, I was not a writer back then. I never thought about writing. I journaled, I wrote that in my diary. I did those types of things all the time since I was knee high to a grasshopper, but never did I consider myself an author. And he, he took that phrase, that statement, and he turned it in. So I say all that to say, I love sharing about hope during heartache. I love encouraging people to read it because it's 12 different people. My story's in there also, but it's 11 other people, men and women, fathers and mothers. And each story is so different. There's one lady who has lost eight children. And yet her perspective is she has eight children alive, eight children that will she'll meet in heaven. So she's had 16 pregnancies and her perspective is so full of hope is so godly. Like you would think I, I was devastated with one. How would I have been able to pick myself back up after eight? Mm -hmm. But you read her story and you're like, wow. And then there's another lady who was in bed for like three days or a week. And finally her husband said, Hey, I need you to get up. You need to, to live again. And she had that grieving period and then she was able to cope better. So she didn't have that the long months that I had where it was just so difficult. And, and even the beginning of the book just talks about, um, addresses the question that you asked, and that's what can you say to people who are hurting who've had a miscarriage? And a lot of things that were said to me at the time really didn't help. Honestly, it, for me, I was thinking about you and how you went through that earthquake last fall. And I have never been in an earthquake like that. I 
honestly can't imagine how scary that would be. Knowing that I've never experienced it, but knowing that I feel empathy for you, I think the best thing to say when you truly don't know what to say is just, I'm so sorry. I have no words. I think that's so much better than there was probably something wrong with the baby or God wanted another angel or um, you'll see your baby in heaven again. Yeah, I know I will, but that's not helping me right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so just, I'm sorry, or just nothing, just being there. It, it was interesting because as I was telling, we had just told people we were pregnant. So I had to go back and tell them that we weren't pregnant. And the responses that I got were so different. One lady just sobbed. She says, I lost two babies and I never talk about it. And she just sobbed in my arms. And I ended up comforting her mm -hmm. as I was still in shock that I was had lost because I had lost the baby like two days before and she's sobbing in my arms. So it's, everybody reacts so differently. Like some people, the anniversaries mean nothing. Even husbands and wives act differently and respond differently. Like for me, I needed to name our baby. Mm -hmm. I just did. My husband said, I, I support you. I can't do that because we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. So I named it a name that could go either way. So when I meet the baby in heaven someday, I will call it, <laughs> you know, either the boy version or the girl version. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we, he, he, my husband bought me a little ornament that we put on our tree every year because we lost the baby December 14th. So mm -hmm. that Christmas was horrible. And so every, and our children know, they know that this is, um, actually, I named the baby Joseph Craig, and so I can either call it Joey for Josephine or Joey for Joseph. Mm -hmm. But so we have a little um, ornament. It's of a little child with a green outfit, very gender neutral. And our kids know that's that's for Tater Tot was actually what we had nicknamed the baby because we had a six year old and a three year old. So when you tell them that you're pregnant, they're like, "Oh, it's a Tater Tot." I'm like, "Yep, it's Tater Tot." <laughs> that's it. That name will stick. <laughs> yep, exactly. So yeah, the best thing I think to do is to just, just listen and just say you're sorry. Cause as much as like my mom actually came back after she read hope during heartache and she read not just my story and she lived it with me. Like they live here where we live. Um, and she lived it with me, but after she read it and after she read the other people's story, she came back to me and she said, I am so sorry. She says, I had no idea no idea. And I said, I don't expect you to. I said, you've never lost a baby. Thankfully, you've never lost a child. Mm -hmm. So I don't, ex and that's the thing, like, you don't expect me to understand how it feels to live in an earthquake. But, um, and I don't expect you to, to learn or to know how it feels to lose a baby. But just, just being able to, to meet in the middle, and I think less is more. Yeah, I like that. And that is, that's what I love about this book though, is if you're going through heartache, if you're looking for hope through heartache, you can read it, but it would be really beneficial for someone, for anyone to read. And I love that you have men and women. I think that's amazing. Um, but it would be really beneficial to read, to help know how to pray for people, how to support people that are going through these things, even if you yourself aren't or haven't. So yeah. Um, and these things are specific to losing children. That's what these, these stories are specific to people who have lost children. Well, Correct. where can our listeners find you and find your books? Because this uh, isn't well, your only book. <laughs> right, right. Um, if they go to my website, which is basically just my name, so Sherry Swalwell, C-H-E-R-I-S-W-A-L-W-E-L-L, -L -L, um, nobody can spell our last name. I'm used to that. Uh, if they just go there, there's a listing of all of the books that I have. And if you click on it, then that will take you to all the different stores that they're available in. So they used to just be in Amazon, but now I've branched out. And so they're in, in other retailers. And so hopefully my, your favorite one will be listed and you'll be able to find it. Great. Well, how can we be praying for you? Um, just that I can continue to encourage and help other women. Like my heart, I have a heart and I have always had a heart since I was young before still in elementary school really is for marriage and family, for husbands and wives, for women. Um, I want to take what God has 
the challenges that God has allowed in our lives, I want to take and use that for his glory. So any way that I can encourage or support or help other women as they go through difficulties or marriages or with children, that that's really my heart. So I would love prayer that God will just open the doors he wants opened and that I will hear him clearly and not try to push through a window or something. <laughs> <laughs> and is your husband's health, has he recovered from what he struggled with for many years? Is he well now? Well, it, it was a 10 to 12 year journey. And I would say that he still probably, he still probably could. Um, well, I, I don't know if you really want to call that he's in remission, but he is like, 90 to 95 percent better than he was he still needs to be careful but our life is very different now than it was like god has has healed god has restored and i just i'm excited to see what god still has in store great oh i'm so glad to hear that all right sherry well thank you so much for joining us and i'm going to close us in prayer thank you god we just thank you for this opportunity to talk about hope and just for Sherry's willingness to show to share her very personal story um, so that others can be encouraged and learn from her. God, we just lift her up to you. We just ask that you would continue to give her creative ways um, that you can use her talents and her gifts to reach women who are hurting and reach families and marriages for your glory and for your kingdom. God, we just thank you for what you have already done. And we just pray for a season of open doors for Sherry, God, that you would just fling the doors wide open to let her message get out to many people and direct her, just give her targeted direction for exactly where you want her to serve and her next steps for um, serving you and, and just serving others. Um, and to lift up other women. We just pray for her marriage, for her children. We give you thanks and praise and glory that her husband is has improved so much. And we just pray your sustaining hand on his health. And we just pray that you would continue to allow him to be well and to continue to, to get back to 100%. And um, we just thank you so much for who you are and just the ways that you can transform the difficulties and the pain in our lives that no pain is wasted you can redeem that pain and use it for beautiful things and for healing and restoration and we just thank you god we give you praise for that and and just be glorified in jesus name amen amen